Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 28, update from Strawberry Rock Tree Sit, featuring Lupine. In this special breaking news episode, I talk again with Lupine, a tree sitter in Northern California, who I originally interviewed for episode 19 back in early June. Forest defenders have been occupying trees around Strawberry Rock, north of Eureka and Arcata, since April 1st. And in the last week, Green Diamond, the logging company, has resumed work in the area, clear-cutting the forest. Lupine has been witnessing this tragedy firsthand from her perch 60 feet up in one of the trees. So last time I talked to you, you were up in the tree and everything was chill and, you know, there weren't any problems and now the situation is different. That's right. Yeah. Are you, are we just talking or are you recording? I, I'm actually recording. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. No, that that's fine. I just wanted to know if I should speak casually or what. Oh, yeah. Um. Yeah, just in the last two weeks, um, Green Diamond started active logging work adjacent to where we're sitting. So we've been witnessing it for a couple weeks now. Right. And are you up in the tree right now? Yes, I'm in I'm maybe 60 feet up in a redwood tree right now. Uh-huh. In the same... And I'm listening to I'm listening to machinery working just down the hill from us. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. So uh, from up there, you can actually see... Um, you can actually see them working. Yeah, there's this big clear cut right below me, um, and the tree that I'm in is right next to the road. And so, for the past several days, we have been watching heavy machinery um, move logs around and watching log trucks roll out of here. And we're kind of on on one side of the hillside, so we're protecting like this the sliver of trees. Um, they haven't been able to cut yet because of our presence. Right, but there's still a section that nobody's in, so they're going after that right now. Yeah, and um, what they've been cutting here are, yeah, excuse me, um, yeah, we're we're kind of attempting to defend the um, largest and most complex um, trees in in the area that's slated to be cut, and um, they've been clear cutting everything else. Right. And did I read something about how they, uh, Green Diamond, that is, had agreed to sell part of what they had there to someone or? Yeah. So the timber harvest plan that I'm currently sitting in has five units and um, we're just in one of them and they've clear cut three of them. And then the fifth unit is um, an area that forest defenders um, protected for years before with tree sits. And um, part of the uh, that was that was part of what contributed to uh, this deal arising between Green Diamond and um, Trinidad Coastal Land Trust. And under that deal, um, the Trinidad Coastal Land Trust is slated to buy uh, an easement um, over this area that includes a, a grove of trees and the trail leading up to Strawberry Rock and Strawberry Rock itself. Um, and so the company isn't logging in that in that specific area right now because that that deal is is currently being worked out but they're logging directly adjacent to it so when folks hike up to the up to strawberry rock after this is done they'll see clear cuts on three sides right right and of course you know what i've noticed anyway um when i've been to places where they've logged and they've left sections behind is that uh very quickly within you know, a couple of years, especially during winter winds, the trees will start to blow down um, on the part that was left intact. And so it sort of gets eroded over time. Yeah, it's so true. And the clear cut that that is just down the hill for me here, there's a few leaf trees scattered throughout it. um, And that's part of the Green Diamond's wildlife tree scheme that um, is part of what earns them sustainable certification and approval from CAL FIRE and um, other agencies. And it's 
I agree with you. It, it seems dubious. And I think um, often those leaf trees that are alone in the clear cuts suffer from wind throw and it's hard for them to survive because they are, of course, supposed to be part of a, a complex web of forest life and they're just alone there. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I've totally seen that make a difference before. So how many um, are, are they working there every day and about how many people? And uh, Yeah, it's been uh, probably 10, 10 days. I apologize. The days are sort of starting to run together um, oh, I get because it. they've uh -huh. been they they come in. They bring the machines in at 3 a.m. and um, work most of the day. And the machinery has been out here every day. They don't take Sundays off. And um they have company workers out here every day. So most of the days during the workday, um, they have green diamond trucks parked at the base of our trees or workers standing at the base of our trees um, guarding us while they are logging in the area. Uh huh. As in to keep the other employees away from the trees that you're in or? Um, I mean, they are saying that, that those the people are there for our safety. I, I think that I, I genuinely believe the company is trying to keep us from from going down and interfering with work. Right, right. And so, well, because at this point, if you came back, came down, maybe it would be hard to go back up. I, I assume so. I think the company doesn't doesn't want us to sit here. We're a liability and we're keeping them from from logging the this forest that they want to log. And I would imagine they'd rather that we weren't sitting in these trees. Right. So how are you supplied up there? Um, we are, we're pretty good on supplies, um, partly because this is our home. We've been living up here for four months now, so we're, we're comfortable and we're well supplied. Right. It seems like water would be the hardest part. Yeah. And we're not under 24 hour guard, so it, it's not, um, ah, uh, okay. There was the other night there was an, an incident where, uh, um, I mean, I don't want you to give to away too much. Oh no, it's okay. Um, the other night ground support came to resupply, a tree sitter and um, a company employee walked up on them while that was happening and they didn't give chase. They allowed them to like get them the water and food they were bringing. Oh, okay. All right. So, I mean, they're not being as much of jerks as they could be yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you've heard the stories about them sending up climbers and pepper spraying people in trees and what have you. I mean, it's a whole thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that often we talk, especially in this area where there's this like what you're referring to, like the, the potent history of forest defense and um, really kind of violent company response. Um, it's it's really interesting to witness this this like kind of new era where the timber companies have rebranded themselves as sustainable and are temp attempting to like cultivate like really good public relations and are engaging in really, really heavy greenwashing. And um, it's it's interesting to witness the the ways that they're willing to treat us as nonviolent activists in the woods, and um, that uh, what am I trying to say? Excuse me. Um, I think they still they still need to stop forest defenders because we are really bad publicity for them, and we're calling attention to the fact that they're not sustainable. But they ha they're attempting to do it in more underhanded ways is what it seems like to me compared to the way that, that um, timber companies were acting towards forest defenders in the nineties. Right. Right. And you also have the advantage of being so close to uh, Eureka and Arcata there. Yeah, it's true. Like uh, the forest we're defending is not very remote. It's a forest that's familiar to a lot of people. So people know what's at, at stake here. Um, it's an area that people are attached to and it's like an area that's accessible and, um, right now, the company is also posting security at the trailhead every day to keep hikers from going to the rock and where they're because they're actively logging there. Um, but normally, folks are hiking out here all the time, um, and so like hiking on these, these these even though these are private timberlands, hiking here is is normal in this community. Right, right, yeah. That's you, you mentioned that before in our previous conversation that that's a popular spot for people to come visit. Yeah. So has there been much uh, attention given to this and the local media there yet? Um, there's, uh, I feel like it's been somewhat limited. Um, we often speak with KMUD News. Um, oh, KMUD, they're great. KMUD is great. We love KMUD and we're, we're grateful that they're 
willing to discuss these issues. And um, other than that, not that I know of. Oh, just k so far. Yeah. Okay. I think there's there's so much going on right now, and I really respect I respect all of the media attention that's being given to um, to the uprising, to this massive rebellion against police brutality and for Black Lives. And um, yeah, I'm yeah. <laughs> Do you have a, a sense at all of how how much longer the Green Diamond people are going to be there? You know, like say that say that you don't leave, so they're not able to get to that portion. Like, is it days or weeks or months or? Well, the company issued a press release the day they began logging here, saying that they intended to uh, clear cut all of this um, in the next uh, month and a half or so. So if if they're able to do the work that they want to do, they'll be done by the end of September. Um, and they so they're currently logging in the timber harvest plan that that I'm I'm currently sitting in as I speak to you. They also just began just a few days ago logging in a second timber harvest plan where we have another tree sit. It's very close. It's just a few minutes walk, um, and it's hard to know when they'll finish logging there. Um, that timber harvest plan is about 40 acres and tree sitters are sort of defending the, what we, what we identified as like the, the biggest trees in the most complex forest within that 40 acres. Right. Right. And have any of you had communication with the uh, green diamond people yourselves? Um, our support, uh, I mean, we, the, the green diamond um, employees who guard our trees will, they'll kind of inform us of things. They'll show up in the morning and they'll say, okay, we're going to start logging right next to you. And we're kind of just like, okay, like we don't, that's not safe. And uh, we're in a climate crisis and the sixth mass extinction. And we wish for you to stop industrial logging across your ownership. And then they'll go and start the machinery. And it's like, it's a strange conversation. Right. Um, but they're, um, you know, there's like a certain amount of dialogue just because they're out here all day and we're out here all day. Right. And are they like, I guess these are probably just working dudes for the most part. So these are like guys in like their what, 30s and 40s probably or 20s. I mean, like, are they your age or you know what I mean? It's a mix. The The person who I, I believe to be like the kind of Green Diamond security head honcho is um, an older gentleman. Um, but there are a lot of younger um, security guys who are out here and I don't, maybe security is the wrong word. They seem like they're just green diamond employees. The machine operators are, are older, um, folks. Um, a lot of them bring their dogs. Their dogs are really cute. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've talked to, but this is, uh -huh. go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I've talked to a, a, a few loggers before in the past, you know, in, in settings somewhat like you're talking about, you know, where there was forest defense going on. And, you know, a lot of them, you know, th you know, that I talked to were just like, oh, well, I don't want to work in an office. I like being outside. And so there's that portion of it that's kind of like, well, OK, I get that, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's like an interesting connection that we share with those people that were the only two them like often forest defenders and loggers are the only two demographics of people that actually get to witness these ecosystems out here. Right. I mean, this place isn't very remote, but a lot of times forest defenders will be working in really remote areas and we're the only people that get to witness them b before and after the logging happens. And, to, and for me, just in the past 10 days, it's been really fascinating and really saddening just to watch this work progress every day. Right. Um, and watching the log, the log trucks rolling out and just seeing that firsthand is, I mean, in Humble in Humboldt County, a, a lot of folks witness this or are privy to some aspect of the industry. And Green Diamond is logging just upstream or uphill of the places where a lot of people live. And so a lot of people see this. But I think like across the country, the people who the consumers who buy this lumber, um, and just more broadly, the public aren't are there have there's no way for them. There's no way for them to be aware of like the devastating reality of industrial logging that we're witnessing, you know. Right. Right. Yeah. No, that's totally true because they just don't. I mean, most people 
you know, living in the city, even in the West, don't come out and see these places very often. Yeah, it's not it's not accessible to people. And um, I feel like that's part of our job is just to let to 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 try to witness this and let people know what it looks like and what it feels like, what's actually happening, because most people aren't able to to see it themselves. Right. Right. So so the last the last 10 days where they've been in there working, uh, it sounds like you get woken up pretty early in the morning by machinery and then it goes on like until sundown or um yeah the machines will come in at at 2:33 um and they'll usually work till about 3 p.m. I was really curious today today it it's sunday i don't know when this podcast will come out but as i'm speaking it's uh, sunday yeah, and i'm going to put it out today um, if i can yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> I was curious to see if they would work today. The contractor who is signed on to this timber harvest plan, their business name is Lord's Light Logging. So I was oh, like, my. are these guys really going to work on a Sunday? But they showed up at 3 a.m. just like they have been. That's interesting. I suppose that's a whole other discussion. Is you know, Are there connections between evangelical Christianity and um, you know, ecocidal resource extraction? Yeah, when I when I saw that that was the name of the contractor, I immediately thought of um, Daryl Cherney's song, um, "You Can't Clear Cut Your Way to Heaven." But I don't want to make any presumptions about the the any about about the workers here. There was a log truck driver who rolled up waving a, a big Trump 2020 flag, um, but beyond what they're beyond that i have no idea right right like, now you can't i don't tell. i don't want to assume what kind of people they are right right so um i mean i hope this doesn't sound like a stupid question but um i mean what are the i mean how are you feeling about all this what are your what's what's going what's going through th- your head for you um i think i think it's kind of challenging to process witnessing this work I yeah I suppose I'm just trying to to process it and when I look down at the clear cut below me it's it's hard to see like the forest that I've I've been living in transformed and to see like see an a uh, trail that we would walk through that berries were growing along now opened up into a road and now the trees on both sides are coated with dust and there's trucks driving up it every day. It's hard. It's, it's crazy to witness that, um, that change in the landscape. Um, but when I look down at the clear cut, mostly what I think about is knowing that this is happening everywhere, that this is happening all over the Pacific Northwest right now. And that I'm just glimpsing a tiny, a tiny bit of it. Um, and that's the kind of enormity of that is hard for me to fathom. Yeah, yeah, because this, of course, is is the height of logging season. So, right. So I know all over, all up and on the coast, there's, the yeah, this um, machinery is working and the log trucks are rolling and. Right, and then it's happening all over the world too, like in the Amazon and and up in Canada and etc. It's true, and and I feel connect like I feel like there's a connection between these things, partly. Um, I mean, anyone can recognize that illegal logging is is really horrible, but in some ways, I almost think that this like greenwashed legal logging is more insidious. And the certifier, the Forest Stewardship Council, the certifier, it's like a third party um, organization that rubber stamps green diamonds timber as sustainable. They uh, they certify operations all over the world, and if you look into into the kinds of logging that they certify, it's it's really heinous. And I think there's, I think that's blatant greenwashing and that's happening in tropical forests and in temperate forests all over the world. Um, and, and that's the best, those are like the best forest products you can buy are the ones certified by Forest Stewardship Council, but we're out here in the woods seeing what that actually looks like and it's awful. And so I can't even imagine what illegal logging, logging operations are looking like right now. Right, right. So, so like in the area you're in there, you mentioned the leaf trees before, like, uh, you know, trees that they're leaving that they're not taking. Is that how many do you know do you have an idea of like how many per acre that is or yeah the um the wildlife tree policy the company is operating under requires one to two leaf trees per acre depending on um i I apologize i don't totally understand how their system works the timber harvest plans are kind of cryptic but i've been um attempting to understand them and 
Uh, but yeah, they, they're required to leave one to two trees per acre and they have a whole criteria for those trees. So if it's a certain diameter at breast height, if it has certain like habitat features, like a complex crown or deeply furrowed bark, then it's supposed to meet the leave tree criteria and be retained, be marked for retention. But we walk through the woods before they cut an, an given unit and we see what's marked and what's unmarked. And it doesn't it seems incongruous with their own policies. Right, right. So so in other words, trees that should be left that aren't marked. Yeah, it depends on, it. like, in an area that they're clear-cutting, they only mark the things, the trees they're going to leave. And then in an area where they're selection logging, they mark the trees that they're going to take. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, I didn't um, know about selection logging. I mean, in my in my experience before, all I've seen is they go through and they just mark with red, usually the trees that they're going to leave. Because, of course, they're taking most of them, so it's easier to mark the ones they're leaving. Yeah, and that's the case here. And these the units that we are sitting in are predominantly clear-cut. It'll be like a 20 acre unit and 15 acres of that are clear cut, but then part of it is next to a stream. So they're required to like selection log that area. And so they'll go in and mark the trees to be taken there. I don't know. It's kind of like nitty gritty timber harvest plan semantics, but these things inf inform a lot for us because we'll walk through an area and whether or not a given, a given tree is marked is, is something that we're always looking out for. Right. Right. And just to give people an idea, um, an acre is 220 by 220 feet, you know? So mm -hmm. like in Portland, Oregon, the the small blocks that they have in the residential neighborhoods there in downtown, those are 200 by 200 feet. So it's like leaving one tree per city block in some place like, like Portland. I mean, that's like, it's it, it really just seems like they're just doing that so that they can say that they didn't take everything. But the difference between that and taking everything is so small that it almost doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's a good way to, to describe it. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. And then along the streams, they probably have to stay back at least 50 feet or a hundred feet or something like that. Or. Yeah. Depending on the, the water courses are like organized into classes um, depending on to what extent they're year round and fish bearing. And then there's prescriptions for how far away from each of those classes they need to stay. I think part of what is troubling to to us is that the, there's not, it, it appears to us that there's not a lot of oversight. And um, so the company's required to conduct botanical surveys, but like the timber harvest plan where my comrade is, is sitting right now, the company it's, a 40 acre timber harvest plant and the company only spent one they had a, a botanist go out there for one hour to survey for rare and endangered plants wow. and they went at the wrong season so for some of those plants bloom times and emergence so it's possible that they could have missed things and so i think the, the company falls short in their own um oversight over the areas slated to be cut and then additionally the agencies that certified the timber harvest plants they are also all supposed to come out to the site and and check all this work, you know, like if the company says we're leaving this many trees to check that they're actually leaving that many. But I don't think that these these agencies, Cal Fire, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, I don't I suspect that they are not actually looking at all of these units, really closely reviewing the paperwork. And um, I don't I fundamentally don't think they're doing their job in holding these the timber harvest like these private timber companies accountable. Right. So it really seems like one of the messages, main messages here that y'all have is that the um, the lumber that's certified, well, what, what do they call it? They call it, um, what's the name of it? Oh, sorry. Forest Stewardship Council is a certifier. Right, right. That that's, uh, it's, well, it sounds like it's pretty sketchy. Yeah, um, if if folks are interested in that, um, there was last fall a uh, maybe forty minute long documentary came out about the Forest Stewardship Council in particular, exposing um, kind of their their like lack of accountability or the lack of accountability they hold these companies to. Um, yeah, I think I mean it feels like one of the of the most heinous things at play here is the greenwashing. Ultimately, we're just we just are we seek an end and we fight for and dream of an end to industrial logging, whether or not it's labeled as quote sustainable. 
Right, right. Okay, and people can follow along. Uh, right now, you are posting on Instagram, I believe, right? Yeah, we're trying to keep people updated on Instagram. Um, and we also have if we're if folks want to get involved. I know I don't know where people are who are listening to this, um, but if people want to get involved, they can reach out to us directly. Our they can reach out to us on Instagram at Redwood Forest Defense or email us. Our email is redwoodforestdefense at protonmail.com. Um, and if people want to get involved in this struggle in particular, awesome. But Green Diamond is clear cutting across a million and a half acres in California, Oregon, and Washington. And of course, s- stuff like this is happening all over the country and world. And we feel very much in solidarity with forest defenders, land defenders, and water protectors. And yeah. When folks far away are like, how can we help? I'm like, resist where you live. (laughs) Totally. Totally. Yeah. Because I mean, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very tragic truth. It seems of our time that, you know, nearly everywhere is a battleground for something. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I don't want to take up too much of your, of your time. Um, Did you want, it's been about a half an hour. Did you want to, to say anything to kind of tie this all up or um i sorry i'm, not, I'm i was momentarily distracted because the i think the machine is leaving for the day I can see it slowly creeping up up the hill um oh sure it's like two in the afternoon <laughs> there right yeah i think it's uh the he's probably been working out here for about 12 hours so i think he's heading home now what kind of machine is that one that you're saying um, it, it looks just like a massive excavator, but it has a claw on it and, uh, they use it to pick up and move the logs. Um, so they're coming through the area that they have already clear cut. All the logs are on the ground and this machine sorts them in and piles them up into log decks and moves the slash. And it's, a, it's a tractor treads. It's a huge machine. And so as it's, as it's moving over the soil, it's compacting it and it's, devastating to have to after watch, walking through the forest and and seeing how deep the duff is and how like shaded and moist the ground is and witnessing all the ferns and the huckleberries that grow under the canopy it's kind of devastating to now look down at this area and it's just a mess of churned up soil and slash and it's compacted from the tractor treads Right, because we talk about the trees, but of course the tree is, is, you know, the trees, that's a few species out of the hundreds or even, you know, thousands who are making that area their home. Yeah, it's true. And in the the other timber harvest plant uh, to the north of us, um, the company documented two osprey nest sites um, really close to the northern boundary of the timber harvest plant. And just the other day, my comrade who's sitting there heard the ospreys call um and they what they think was we hadn't heard the osprey um prior to that and my comrade is hearing a lot of birds and what they think is maybe going on is that the um logging that's happening there is disrupting um disrupting all the various creatures that live in this forest and call it home of course yeah i mean this is a big nightmare for them that's for sure yeah i think a, a lot of times like we often get wrapped up in narratives around the safety of forest defenders and the company is endangering us when they cut trees near us. But what we're really fighting for is the safety of the forest. And, um, the company will say that what they're doing is, is safe for us. Oh, we're not going to cut the trees you're in or the trees right next to you, but it's fundamentally not safe for all the creatures that live out here for them to log anywhere here. Right. Have you seen your flying squirrel friend? Oh yeah, they visit us. We have to keep our food really locked up. <laughs> <laughs> they're tenacious. <laughs> That's cool. So they're still around. Um, yeah, and I mean the tr- the worst the clear cuts next to us, and then the trees we're in are sort of on the edge of the intact forest. So I think they can still get around in the canopy over here. Right. Right. Cool. Well, I'm really sorry to, to hear what's what's happening there, uh, but I'm really uh, glad that you were able to talk to me today. I really appreciate you chatting with me and um, bringing attention to this. And I've been um, 
one thing that's been really nice is just going on Instagram and seeing all of the beautiful pictures of your garden. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. Thanks for sharing. That. <laughs> I'm grateful we have there's some local folks with gardens who will kick us down veggies, which is a real treat. Oh, that's great. That's really important because, of course, that's what you'd you know really be missing out there. Yeah, and we have little lettuce plants and containers up here, but I'm not going to lie. It's kind of a challenge to garden in a redwood tree, and we're, <laughs> it's right by the coast. It's incredibly foggy and <laughs> windy. It's not the best conditions for <laughs> for modern <laughs> vegetable <No>. varieties. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I had no idea you were trying to do that there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, so people, the, is uh, Instagram the best place to, to follow you? Yeah, Um. Yeah, we also we have a website. It's redwoodforestdefense.org. Um, so our handle is the same across email, Instagram, and the web if people want to find us and reach out. Right. Okay. I mean, in case things things get worse or there needs to be like suddenly more people coming out there or something, because that's a possibility. Yeah. If anyone wants to come live in a tree, come on. Yeah. Contact us. <laughs> That sounds great. Well, it's so nice to talk to you, Lupine. Thanks for talking to me today. Thanks for reaching out to me, Colibri. I I really appreciate your camaraderie. Yeah, no, I I I really I really respect what you're doing, and and I'm I'm I am happy that you're out there, and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully uh, we'll have a chance to talk again. I hope so too. I'll keep you posted. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.